first thing that I'm going to share with you is that this is Steve and Debbie's first ever time to visit Ireland. So I was going to ask that you show your appreciation and give them a full-hearted Irish Caird Miela Fáilte. We talked a little bit about emotional connection earlier on. How's the emotional connection going so far? So far, so good, Ian. It's going well. <laughs> Amazing. So you've already made the day. Yep. <laughs> so um, the place I'd like to start, I was struck by Evelyn talking about storytelling. And we shared a bit of time. We met for the first time in person yesterday at the base camp event. And it was one of the themes that persisted throughout the afternoon. And as human beings, stories are the most natural thing that we do because we have to tell ourselves stories in order to make meaning of things. And there are stories about everything. So the first question that I'd like to ask Steve and Debbie, as first timers in Ireland, is that there's a story about Ireland, but the story isn't always the reality. So the opening question I'd like to ask you as you've landed here, not quite a moon landing, but is how does the story that you had about Ireland match up to the reality of what you've experienced in the couple of days since you've been here? So who'd like to start? I, I, I don't mind. I can start. So before coming to Ireland, I made sure to reach out and do my research. I also spoke to some of my colleagues who had been here in the past. And so I've got three observations. The first observation is your weather is more lovely than I was told it was going to be. <laughs> The second observation is I was told I was not going to have any issue finding a uh, lovely pint of Guinness, and I've had no issues with that. <laughs> and the last and more serious observation is I was told across the board how kind uh, and friendly and welcoming the Irish community and, and, and the people were, and it's exceeded my expectations. It's been wonderful here. Um, we, we looked lost on the corner our very first day here, and multiple people came up, and it was probably my look that had us looking lost. Uh, but gave us all sorts of opportunities and ideas of where we could go and, and adventure in the city, so it was great. Lovely. So far, so good. Until now. Until now. <laughs> Debbie, how about you? Uh, and for me, I would say very similar. So the weather did not disappoint. I think that I did pack some boots because I was told it was going to rain, and it was raining my entire first day here. Were they, so, pa were they Patagonia boots? They, uh, unfortunately, no, but okay. don't tell Evelyn. <laughs> Um, the second thing that I would say is I have now replaced water with Guinness, and, and it does taste better here than it does in the United States, I just want you to know. Um, and the third thing for me uh, is just the social aspect of, of the folks here. I think I've had a wonderful time everywhere I went. I felt like an adopted Irish, so uh, here we are. Well, thank you for that, and thank you for sharing. And it, it's, it's great to hear that the store of Ireland mm -hmm measures up to the story that you have, and maybe even exceeds it a little bit. And part of the reason that I asked you the question about the story you had for Ireland is I'm going to flip it on its head. Because everybody in this room has got their own story about NASA. And the remarkable thing is, in the prelude to this and the build-up to it, when I knew I was going to be interviewing on stage two people from NASA, the common reaction I got was, wow. Even my 14-year-old this morning, who comes down in a black hoodie every morning to join us for breakfast, at least physically. <laughs> if we can get one syllable out of him, that's as much as it ever gets. Engagement scores, very low. <laughs> and this morning, when I mentioned the fact that I was interviewing two people from NASA today, he took the hood down and he said, NASA? So that's 100% <laughs> improvement on the syllable output yes. from my son. So I want to say thank you for that. You're welcome. You're welcome. Level. <laughs> but the, the relationship that we have with NASA is a story that we've told ourselves that's been built on so much evidence that's out there. It's so part of our, of our heritage, of our cultural heritage, the idea of NASA. And there are so many movies that have been made about it. Mm -hmm. And it's even entered into our popular lexicon. So when we say, one small step for man, we follow it up with one giant. Giant, giant step for mankind. When we say Houston, 
we have a we problem. problem. We've got a pro <laughs> We've got so we can do our own derivative version of it. And then the final one is when we say failure is not an option. option. Now the interesting thing about that is that yesterday I had the opportunity to talk to your colleague Mike. Mm -hmm. And that, that line came from the movie Apollo 13, which is a movie that we use in our trainings to illustrate culture, leadership, teamwork. Mm -hmm. And it's actually based on what happened in reality. And talking to Mike about Gene Kranz, who issued those lines, or that particular famous line, and he told me all about the relationship that he'd had with him and how he'd worked with him and so on and so yeah. on. So my question to you is, you've got a brand, the NASA brand, I would say, if we were to create a league table of brands in the world, in Western society, the one that is most iconic is probably the NASA brand. So you go to work every day, and you get up in the morning, and you go to work for the most iconic brand in the world that everybody's got a story around. Some people here go for XYZ zip fasteners. It's a very different thing. What's it like getting up to go to work at NASA every day? For me, I'll start. Yeah, uh, it, it's absolutely amazing. So uh, I tell the story about how I have now been at NASA for 17 years. Um, I initially thought I was going to go for three, and then I was going to move on to my next opportunity because I'm somebody who really likes challenge. And usually about three or four years, I'm starting to feel like I have kind of got this. I'm ready to move on to my next thing. Um, and there were two things that I noticed when I got to NASA 17 years ago. The first was that nothing happens at NASA without the work of a team. Um, so it's a very team-based collaborative organization. And then the second thing was that uh, we do not have a retention problem at NASA. People come <laughs> when out of, straight out of high school and they're there for their entire careers and, and in some instances they stay for a very long time. And so my background is in organization development and at the time when I joined the organization, NASA had one of the largest cadres of internal OD professionals across the federal government, which to me was pretty amazing because what was typical was that people would purchase that particular um, function. And so uh, it showed me that NASA is an organization that kind of stands behind what they value. So if teamwork is truly one of their core values, they wanted to invest in a cadre of folks who could really help support a team, make them better, look at team development, and really try and instill that in everything they do. So, so it's just, it's continued for the last 17 years, and I will say that the other thing for me, like what it's like to work at NASA, no, no two days are the same. Mm -hmm. And there are tons of opportunities. So as I said to you, I'm somebody who usually moves on to my next opportunity after three years, and talent mobility is a really big thing at NASA. There are opportunities anywhere that you'd like to go. So in 17 years, I've had five different roles. I've worked at two of the field centers and at headquarters, and I will tell you it's because of the opportunity and the care and feeding um, that NASA does of its workforce. Okay. Thank you for that endorsement that, that, that you've had from three years to staying 17 years. Mm -hmm. uh, and Steve, your experience is different. So you're, you're kind of the new kid on the block. And, and I'm interested in, you, what story did you have about NASA before you came in? Because you came from law enforcement. And what did you find as soon as you arrived with the new set of eyes? I like hearing I'm the new kid on the block. I, I visited some schools this week. I told them I was 30. I think they actually fell for it. Um, <laughs> so new kid on the block makes sense. Yes, of our NASA contingent that's here right now, I am the, the newest person. I've been with NASA for just over two years. Um, and just for context, before NASA, I had a, a full military career with the United States Army. Um, and then I went into working for the Department of Homeland Security, which again is very law enforcement. And that was for about a decade and a half before I ended up at NASA. Wonderful organizations. Um, but everything that Debbie said is, is extremely true. Um, from the very moment I walked through the door, the connectedness of our workforce just stood out. Um, and you know, soon we'll be we'll be sharing some videos and whatnot. But when when I look at that as somebody who's brand new, I'm I'm obviously inspired because I haven't had much time around NASA. And every day I see these new innovations happening and, and the new work that's that's just taking place all all across the agency. And I am I'm inspired to come to work. I'm excited to be there. And when you look at somebody who's been in the agency 17 years. 30, 40 years, we have people who have been around a long time. Yep. They are just excited, just as excited today at 40 years at NASA as I am at two. 
And I think there's something to be said about the way that we communicate and connect everybody at NASA to the mission, regardless of role. Okay. So we're going to get to mission in a second. But the thing that struck me when I first started to look more deeply into NASA in preparation for this was even I was surprised at the scale mm -hmm. and the scope of what NASA does. Sure. So, so do you want to just talk a little bit about, about the, the, some vital statistics about the number of centers and the number of employees and budget and just, just a couple of those things so people get an understanding of what that is scale-wise? Absolutely, and I need to get this right because I have my colleagues in the, in the room with me. So, so NASA has about 18,000 civil servants, just like Debbie and I. In addition to that, we have uh, an impact of about three, uh, 312,000 jobs worldwide when you start looking at our partners, our contract workforce. That's about the size of Cork. It's about the size of Cork. There you go, just to say. I knew that, Ian. Yes, yeah. about the size of Cork. Um, You'll get a good pint down there as well, by the way. Absolutely. Uh, I heard it was Murphy's. Yes. I wasn't going to say. Right. I apologize. Yeah. However, my grandmother's maiden name was Murphy, so anyway. Um, our economic impact out of NASA is about $64 billion uh, annually. And that's based on, and that's out of a $23 billion operating budget. So we, we give back a considerable amount uh, with our economic impact. I think the other thing that I would say is that I, folks sometimes don't know that we have 20 facilities and centers across the United States. So there are really 10 field centers and they do various things. So, you know, the center that we support, for example, does a lot of research on aeronautics. There are others that do research on um, earth sciences and climate studies. There are some centers that look at satellites and launching satellites, and then everybody knows the big centers, the ones that have the launch capabilities and the ones that focus on human space flight. But we do so many more things than just those things that I, I think people sometimes lose that um, and, and don't, don't know that. I, I was struck this morning about when Leah was on the stage, your colleague Leah, talking about the leadership side of it, the L&D side of it. And she talked about when things were tight, she was on a $3 budget. Yep. Mm -hmm. And uh, I thought of that, about that in the context of the fact that actually the budget at NASA is almost a half a percent of the US federal budget. It is. Correct. Yep. But so. just for context, what's interesting about that is um, in the Apollo days, when we were launching things, our budget was actually 5%. So when Leah says that you know, she's got $3 to spend, she, she really means it. So we had a much larger budget in the past than we do currently. It's all relative, right? It is. OK. So that, that gives a sense of what the, what, what the scale of NASA is. Uh, so it's not just mission control. This is the point. Yes. Um, in terms of the projects that you're involved in, well, we're going to use a, a little video clip here just to illustrate what, what are the current projects that are going on, right? Absolutely. OK. So if we could roll it, Colette or Julia, over there. We'll take you to the movies. How do you respond to that? Oh. How do you respond to that video when you see it here in front of the audience? It's always inspiring for me. And I 100% I... agree. Every time I see that, I get more excited to do my job. Um, I get more excited to go out and talk to people about what NASA does. Um, 
I kind of feel like it could have been more at the end of this, so they forgot anything I said, and then we get it on a good note, but it, you know, that video just, that's a fraction of what we're doing at NASA, too. There's so much great work happening. Okay. Um, so where I'd like to go is I'd like to go from the story, mm -hmm. and now that we've got the context of what NASA is, is and isn't and what, what you've been doing and some of the projects that are on, and that's only a fraction of it, yeah. I'd like to get into the reality of the store and what it's like there. Yeah. And one of the things that struck me the most in our conversations, and it's also self-evident out there, is the importance of mission. Mm -hmm. And you know, the beauty about this whole conference today is that it runs the full gamut. Because professionally, working with organizations, the gamut runs from when you mention mission to a, to, to a company, you mention mission to a senior executive, they have no idea what you're talking about. So the Eddie Wilson School of Mission mm -hmm. uh, as on one extreme. And then you've got what appears to be the NASA extreme, where mission is absolutely at the center of everything, mm -hmm. and it drives everything that's done. So do you want to talk about how, how is that celebrated, how is it manifested, and how does it, you know, given the scale, given the complexity of NASA, how do you make the mission the thing that drives the gold of people's performance and engagement? So for, for us, we have a saying, and I think you might have heard it in the past, it's, you know, um, people first, mission always. People are at the center of everything we do, and, and uh, Debbie spoke to it earlier. The, no mission gets accomplished at NASA because of an individual. Everything is done because of the, the collective. Yep. And so recently I, I had the, uh, the, the benefit of being in a room where our administrator, Bill Nelson, was speaking to us, and he was, he was communicating about how he operates. When you say administrator, he's the... He, he would be the CEO. He is the top guy. Just at, wanted to make sure there was yeah, nothing left. Administrator for us is the, essentially yes. the CEO. Okay. And he was talking to us about how he operates, and, and he was explaining to us that his team, you know, at the top of NASA operates like a crew. And so when you think about that, that's, that's how everything at NASA takes place. So we've been doing remote work for quite a while. We've got people up on the International Space Station. That's as remote you can't get gets. much more remote than that. However, the operations up on the International Space Station are happening around the clock every second of the day because of a crew. And so for us, it's, it's, a, it's a matter of creating that connection to our workforce and making sure that they understand that people, they, are a priority in our strategic plan. We've got that. It's one of our workforce priorities. And a, a consistent effort through our, our media and our communication to our workforce about how they play into that so that they see themselves in the mission. It's, it, to me, it's really the difference of uh, an employee who shows up to do a job and an employee who shows up to benefit the collective mission or a greater purpose. And so I think that's how NASA brings it together, clearly articulating our mission and then showing how you fit. So, so there's two questions that that stimulates for me. The first is the JFK story that Robert mentioned at the start that's the popular, you know, in, in the popular culture mm -hmm. about the janitor and connecting to the mission. So that was in, in the mid-60s. Mm -hmm. What's the 21st century version of that story today? Yeah, it's the janitor story. It's the same story. <laughs> the very same story. Yeah, um, and, and I would say it's because of our very clear mission. So when you have a mission that has words like exploring the unknown in air and space, innovating for the benefit of humanity, yeah. um, and inspiring the world through discovery, I mean, everybody sees themselves in that particular mission. It's something that they can get motivated by, stand behind and get connected to. And so I think from everybody from the janitor on up feels like they are contributing to something larger than themselves. And, and you know, the greatest distance in the world is the distance between knowing and doing. Mm -hmm. Because we all know the stuff. We all know the language. How, how do you consistently keep the connection between the mission and what people are doing? That is on the surface of it, just day-to-day -day doing tasks that are not related or can easily become disrelated to what the overall mission is. How do you continue to monitor and reinforce that? Because it must take some doing. I think it's how, largely in how we develop our leaders at NASA. Okay. So we develop our leaders, uh, and actually I'll take a step back. Leaders at NASA are at all levels. You don't need to hold a certain position or, or a role to be a leader. We expect um, everyone to be a leader, and, and that's because we focus largely on safety for, for good reason. Um, and so we, we ask our leaders who are in those traditional roles to model the behaviors uh, okay. that you would expect in a crew, which is uh, be humble enough to uh, understand that somebody at the table might have a better solution or a better idea for consideration. Um, 
uh, and just day in, day out to, to seek innovation and, and ask the team to, to come to the table and give it their all. And, and then I'll tell you one thing that I personally really appreciate about NASA is the celebration when success happens. Certainly we, we come back together when we need to refine and, and improve, but uh, boy do we celebrate when a, when a launch goes well, when a project goes well, the entire agency comes together and celebrates. And, and so I think that reinforces how we work. And you talked to me about people who are not connected to the launch, bringing them along to the launch and immersing them in it so that they actually get to see it firsthand so they understand what it is. Yeah, I would say the mission is reinforced in very tangible ways on a daily basis. So we get um, updates daily on what's happening with the missions whenever there is a launch. There are watch parties, even if they're at midnight or 1 a.m. Uh, so the, the people are connected to what's happening, watching it together, celebrating it together, like Steve said. Um, you have opportunities to tour facilities. So one of the things that we do when we onboard new employees, the, one of the very first things they do is they get an opportunity to tour the facility to actually see in a real, li real life way what are the things that that particular center is building and, and what are the things that, that are important to it. So I just think over and over, and, and in our office, one of the things that Steve has done since we are um, supporting the Glenn Research Center and that HR team, because HR, sometimes you know, you think, well, why would HR need to understand the mission? But he really has believed that if we are connected to the mission, we could better support our customers. And so bringing in speakers from the technical side of the house to really talk about what is the work that they're doing and have them also talk to us about how do they see HR and their role connected to what they're doing in the technical side. And, and given that this is a HR uh, leadership event and your HR within what is essentially an engineering, you know, high IQ, highly technical, highly technological, what, what's, what is the same about the HR role as it would be in any organization, and what's different in NASA because it's NASA? I'll use a term from the military. I think what the same is that HR can be a force multiplier for any organization. If leveraged correctly, HR can help uh, an organization become more effect, effective and efficient at delivering whatever their, uh, the, their, their mission is or their goods are. Um, what I think is different at NASA is, is we are part of a crew. We really, you know, we really do have that mentality. So you know, many of my HR staff, myself, we show up in the room and our opinion is valued just as much. There's not a lot of fighting to get to the table, I would say, okay. uh, as there has been traditionally, I think, in industry with HR. So that's probably a little bit different from my perspective. Yeah, I would say, so we've heard the term seat at the table. We have a booster seat in the rocket. So we are there <laughs> riding along with the crew, just like Steve said. Um, so we are definitely an integral part of all of the things that, that um, our customers do. And they really value and see us as part of the success of the mission. So for mission success to occur, they really look at how we are contributing to some of those things for them. OK. And, and before you have quiet quitting or very noisy quitting from people in the audience here thinking, my God, this is so good, I need to resign and go and work for NASA. Mm -hmm. Before that happens, I'm going to ask you the final question in the final minute and a half that we've got. So given that Leonard Cohen said there's a crack in everything, yeah. and that's how the light gets in, where's the crack? Where is, what, what is it that you would change? What is it that, is, that just doesn't work as well as you'd like it to work? Uh, from an HR perspective, um, I think one of the things that I would say is really just getting in the forefront of being a little more proactive. So Leah talked a little bit about how we are very limited in terms of some of the resources we have to be able to continuously develop our individuals, and, and that had been something that was really emphasized in the past. And so if we could get a little more funding to be able to support some of the things we're doing and getting a little more creative in how we are um, training our, our employees and developing them and making sure that they're whole, I think that that would be something that, that I would say is, is important. Steve, anything to add? Slightly different. Um, I, I would say that the challenge that we have at NASA is not different from any other research, scientific, engineering organizations. Um, we look very much the same. So 
uh, on, on the heels of National Women's Day, and, and I've got my lovely engineering daughter in the, in the uh, audience. I would like to see more women in STEM, uh, and I think that NASA is doing a lot of great work around DE and IA to try to improve that. Um, and so I, I just uh, very excited about that continued work, and that's, that's where I hope we change. Good. Thank you very much. We're just out of time. It's time for liftoff, but we're we the go. ones who are going to have to lift off and go and exit here. Thank you very much.